I'm Mary Beth McAteer Margolis for MMTV. Welcome to On Main Street. My guest today is our state representative, Kate Lipper Garabedian. And we're going to be kicking off a series that Kate is going to be doing called Conversations with Kate. So let's meet our representative first and find out a little bit more about her for those of you who haven't really had a lot of exposure to Kate yet and um, hear about what she's been doing as our representative the past year since she's been office. Thank you, Mary Beth. It's so nice to be with you and good to see you over Zoom. I look forward to being able to meet for coffee again like we did some number of years ago when we first <laughs> had a chance to talk about Melrose and all of your service to the city and um, let me have a chance to introduce myself to you. So I'm really thrilled to get to do this conversation um, this way as well. Great. So, um, Kate, just a brief on your background. You've been in Melrose as a resident for, what, about 10 years now? A little bit less than that. We moved okay. when Harrison, my oldest son, wasn't even a year old, and he's now in second grade. So okay. it feels like a long time, but I guess in the span of, you know, uh, context, it's not as long as um, maybe you thought. And you didn't wait too long before you jumped into the um, political arena and threw your hat in for a um, city councilor now, as you're, they're called, uh, at large. That was what, 2017 maybe? That's right, that's yeah. exactly right. So you and I sat down for coffee because you were currently an alderman at large. Yep. Um, and I was exploring the possibility of running for that office. And so that, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's when you were, were sort of deciding and just you know decided to take your talents on to other things. <laughs> Um, but gave me some great advice just about getting to be, you know, in the city and represented and really consider what it meant to be an elected official. It, what, it truly wasn't something that I grew up imagining that I would do. Um, I've always been interested in public life uh, or public policy, I guess you'd say, because my mother covered politics for the state of Virginia for a newspaper. So when I was growing up, I would hear about the stories she was writing um, the things that she was covering at the Virginia State House or even in DC. So I had a sense of how important laws and regulations could be in terms of impacting people in their daily lives. And I think that's what drew me to law school eventually after I was a teacher for a couple of years. And um, teaching was absolutely uh, a, a highlight of my professional career. It was the most challenging job I've ever had, but also by far the most rewarding because on a daily basis, you were just learning so much from your students and also making a real difference in their lives. Um, but I was teaching in the Atlanta public school system and my kids had so much less than what I had growing up in terms of just mm -hmm. stability in the community and resources in the classroom. Um, and I felt as though as a teacher, I could do as much as I could for my kids in that class, but wondered if there weren't ways in which I could work on a more macro level to support kids all over a district or a state. So that's why I ended up going to law school. Um, and I focused there on education law. And then after graduating, worked for a, over a decade in education law and policy, including for the Commonwealth, which has some of the best public schools in the country and in the world, uh, but still has really significant achievement and opportunity gaps. And so there's a lot to, to work on here in our state. Um, and so the time that I met you, I guess it sort of felt like, well, I've, I'm putting down roots in a city. My son is going to grow up here. Now I have two sons growing up here. How can I be of service? Um, and I've always felt that democratically elected government can make such a difference in a positive way for families, for individuals, for communities. And I wanted to reinforce that the people we elect are gonna work really hard for them and be thoughtful about the issues and responsive and give a lot of information just as you were as an alderman. And so um, I was really you know, proud to be able and humbled to be able to serve in that role for the city and now at the state level and try to just reinforce that important relationship between people and their representatives. Um, and so that's what I've been working on for the last year, as you pointed out. Well, you've been, um, you've been, you've really jumped in at a challenging time and congratulations for your extraordinary efforts in um, keeping people abreast of what's mm -hmm. going on. Sure. Um, you, you first ran in a special election when Paul Broder uh, vacated the seat when he became mayor. That's so right. that was like November, was that January, 2020? That's exactly right. Right, so right. It was just about a year ago. December yeah. through March, I would say was the main 
campaign. It was a really short campaign because it was a special election. Right. And, you know, we had that whole discussion in Melrose about when should a mayor take office and our charter required him to take office pretty quickly. And it turned out in some ways to be good for the district because my race, everything happened before COVID hit. So I was able to be sworn in right as the state of emergency um, was established and was immediately, you know, supporting people in Melrose and in the district who had become unemployed and needed to apply for unemployment assistance, who, who were worried about schools closing and access to school meals and all sorts of things like that, where there were a few other special elections around the same time, but they were a little bit behind the one mm-hmm. here. Yeah, and like so April. those, yeah, so those um, communities didn't have a state representative for a a period of some months. Mm. Um, And to your point, there have been a lot of challenges and my office serves as one resource for people. So I'm glad that um, the timing worked that I was in right at the end of March. And then you did have to run again in November. Right. Of this, of last November, 2020. So your term now you began in January with the um, new session. Correct. And uh, you're going to go for two more years, right? Right. So yeah, through this right. calendar year and 2022. Okay. Right. Great. Yeah. So you you're the you're the you're the person that people will uh, be reaching out to for the next uh, couple of years, and certainly um, I'm sure in this past year you've had, um, you know, you you've really had to jump in and be a, a resource in ways that maybe our other state representatives hadn't hadn't had to do in the past um, with the challenges uh, people not being able to go out, right. um, get tests, file for unemployment. Can, sure. you, can you tell us a little bit about your work this past year? Absolutely. So you're right. Um, COVID-19 has taken precedence over everything else um, in everyone's lives. So no different from my own professional role. Um, and as you mentioned, there have been a lot of things that people have had need to know more about or to navigate a system at the state level that they would never have thought they needed to access. So my sense is that representatives before COVID hit would handle some number of unemployment claims and supporting constituents who were working their way through the system. Um, But it's exorbitantly increased during COVID because it's not only a public health crisis, it also has significant economic impact on, you know, everyday life with lots of businesses having to close for a period of time and folks being furloughed. And there's just been a total reshifting of the economy. Um, So we've been helping, you know, more than 100 now, I think, um, residents in the district who have had to figure out how to apply for the benefits for which they're eligible, how to handle the massive fraud issues that hit. I was going to ask you about that. And the country. So that's meant that there have been requirement, additional requirements for identification, verification, and navigating a system. And so I, I do think that when you reach out to your state rep or your state senator, and they're able to also um, escalate the, um, the attention on your claim, that can be helpful. So we've certainly been able to do that. Um, and, and sometimes even just answer questions for people because we've seen the fact pattern enough times to know, oh, well, here's what's the next step for you. You need to upload this number of IDs, the front and back of this one and so forth. And so the Department of Unemployment Assistance has hired scores more people from where they typically would need, um, but it still isn't necessarily enough to keep up with the demand. So having your state rep be involved can be useful. And of course, I encourage anybody to check in with me by email, by phone, um, so that my aide and I can support you in that. But in addition to unemployment, people have been, our small business community has obviously been significantly impacted. So I've tried my best to work with our chamber here in town with small business owners to think about ways to make sure they have the information they knew, need with respect to some of the state grant programs that have come online with the federal support um, that our congressional delegation has pressed so hard to achieve. Um, and as you may know, we've created a whole bunch of resources um, that you can find at kateforrep.com. There's a COVID-19 page. And so based sort of on constituent feedback and also what we're seeing in the community, we've focused some resources on unemployment, on small business relief, on housing security, a big issue for many people. Um, I actually did a community conversation last year and MMTV was kind enough, I think, to air it as well around housing resources that are available. There's one on food security. It includes what our, our Melrose Public Schools are doing with respect to providing meals, but also where there are food pantries and banks in the area that people might want 
to access. Um, and then a few around mental health and well-being. Um, there's a lot of obviously mental health concerns right now with dealing with a, a pandemic for the last year now and the isolation that that causes and the concerns. Um, so those are all available on my website. That's great. And that's Kate for rep. rep. Great. Com. Okay. Yeah. We'll get that up there. Um, okay, and just, just remind our viewers, um, Kate, what um, besides Melrose, which we know you're, um, you represent all of Melrose, what other um, districts it, like part of Wakefield and part of Malden? That's it. Yes, exactly yeah. right. So it's a tiny little sliver of Malden right on the other side of our Wyoming cemetery in the Forestdale Cemetery area, right. which isn't too far actually from where I live. I think and it's then, Ward 5. Maybe in Malden. Very good. Right. Ward five yeah. two. So it's half of a ward of Malden. Yeah. Um, and then I represent a little less than half of Wakefield. Okay. Um, which is, you know, it's nice to have um, to share some municipalities with other reps because that's allowed me a chance to um, have some support and guidance from my colleagues mm -hmm. immediately. So Malden is represented by three representatives. I'm one of them. Wakefield, I share with another representative. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you mentioned Mayor Broder. And since he was such an effective state representative and, a, you know, a friend, it's been really helpful to have him on my speed dial as well over the last year to run ideas by him. Or he's been very proactive in reaching out to me to suggest ways I might step in and help folks. And that's been very, um, very helpful in terms of me being able to serve the community well. And I'm sure you've um, kind of tried to collaborate on things. If you have a constituent who's really in need in Melrose, um, you're probably able to refer them to like the emergency fund or as exactly. you said, the food pantries. That's exactly right. connect them to the council on aging, depending mm -hmm. on the kind of question that we're hearing, or maybe um, the office of planning, you know, for a small business question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, right. it's all hands on deck and folks are really helping that state local partnership has been. Well, I think important. especially because you served on the local level, um, you have that perspective right. and that experience. So um you know, of course, one of the big things that's on everybody's mind these days is the uh, COVID between the testing, which seems to have kind of leveled off a little bit, but now right. the, the big vaccine push. And, um, and Melrose, of course, is, um, I guess we're, we're fortunate that Memorial Hall is part of uh, one of the designated sites in our consortium. Right. Um, six communities, is it? And um, there's going to be a couple of different... Um, vaccination clinics at Memorial Hall. Am I, That's am right. I right? Yes. Yeah. And I really commend the city and I've been in touch with Mayor Broder about this for being proactive about ensuring that we have the infrastructure and that, you know, the capacity to offer this locally. I definitely, I've heard from a number of seniors in the community who are very eager to stay close and maybe even walk if they can to get mm -hmm. a vaccination. And so you know, this is an example where having a health department that um, is coordinating with Wakefields as well. We have a we share and therefore enjoy some efficiencies of scale and synergy. I wonder if that hasn't made a difference here uh, because Wakefield as well has been able to stand up a vaccination right. um, site at, at times. So that's been really great. And how how um, have you been able to be active with any on the state level with um, DPH in terms of advocating for, you know, more vaccines for uh, more, you know, more actual vaccines for uh, those clinics or what's, what's your role been there, Kate? So it's, you know, working closely with the speaker of the house and our COVID-19 task force which are coordinating calls with the HHS secretary, Mary Lou Sutters. We had a call just last week to air some concerns about the, you know, how quickly we're getting shots into arms. I mean, some of this is beyond the state's control. The supply is what it is. Right. And we are allocated a certain amount by the federal government. There also were some rules in place that were recently relaxed about where supply needed to go. And this was set at the federal mm -hmm. level and the federal level, uh, federal government was dictating that a certain percentage of the shots we were receiving were being funneled into one stream. But I understand, but my understanding is the methodology for how many folks actually were in that stream was inflated beyond what was truly needed. And so just last week, um, according to the secretary, we were granted um, discretion by the federal government to start reallocating into other pipelines, which is really important. 
Um, you know, I've read, and then maybe you have as well, that there's this interesting tension around the supply and how we make sure it's equitably allocated so that we're getting it across the system to different communities, including those that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Mm -hmm. So while it's great and really important that we have local options here in our district, I am certainly concerned and share the concerns with my colleagues who represent gateway cities or communities with greater, um, you know, communities of color, where folks have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, they've been more likely to, to get the get the disease, and yet don't have as easy access to some of these yeah. vaccination sites. So that's something that we've certainly aired um, with the secretary, the state just rolled out on Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, um, a, a multi million dollar social media and media campaign, public awareness campaign, to really encourage um, folks to get the vaccine when they become eligible to get it, because there's also been some resistance to that in various communities and concern about the safety of it. So trying to assuage those fears. And I, and I also, um, I also heard that the, um, the state has now a hotline number That's that people right. can call because yeah. the, we're right now we're in the beginning of phase two for 75 yeah. and over. And, um, you know, a lot of folks uh, don't have um, as much experience or the computer savvy um, that, um, you know, the younger generation has in terms of getting online and being able to book a, a, um, an appointment. Right. So, and I think even um, we had a notice, a, a announcement from the mayor's office the other day that, um, you know, there's a number in Melrose that people can call and leave a, leave a, leave a message, um, you know, regarding booking an appointment or they can call the council on age. Council yeah, on I'm really aging. glad you bring that up because in the, and that was something else we absolutely pressed the administration to do was stand up mm -hmm. a, a, a hotline, as you mentioned, right. um, for the very reasons you discussed. And in the absence of that, the council on aging was fielding calls. I offered to start to put people directly in touch with um, the command center that could help book them appointments. And we did that for a good number of seniors last week in Melrose. It might have been the most rewarding thing that we've done. I've done as a state representative was to hear from whether it was the senior him or herself or a family member who just needed help. Um, and it, it's, it's sort of a no brainer that that should have been online right away. Um, mm -hmm. So that did um, hit the ground on Friday of last week. Um, you can call 211 from a Massachusetts phone and um, it'll prompt you into the, the call center to request assistance with getting a vaccine. And you're right, it's for 75 and older currently. And for our Melrose residents who, uh, who are viewing, if you are on the Melrose, cityofmelrose.org website, um, there is a link, a COVID-19 link, and I believe that has the local number, but it is um, just for Melrose residents right now. So, um, okay. but, um, but it's, uh, you know, certainly challenging. People have, um, you know, talked about having more access on a local level, especially for the seniors, because, you know, as wonderful as it is to have Fenway Park and Gillette Stadium participating, right. you know, people have, you um, a more secure feeling sometimes having a, having this done in their own community and certainly in terms of a convenience sake for elderly people who may be not as mobile or um, absolutely don't drive or whatever um yes. so you know thank you for your work on that in terms of advocating for uh, more local access for people yes um, i think that's important so um all of these things that you've been working on, um, the unemployment, the, the COVID, uh, the, the bus small businesses, all of those programs have, I'm sure, um, put a little dent in the state budget um, and cost us, you know, more money having more people come on, on board to, um, you know, to work on the unemployment uh, right. claims and the fraud and all that. So, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the budget and where we're at and what going forward for the sure. coming year? Yes. Um, so, and I remember, and you remember the budget is, is maybe the most important thing that uh, government does, whether that's the local level or the state or federal level, it's sort of an indication of what we value as a community where we're investing the resources that we have. So um, 
the budget for the state is a combination of our, of our revenues that we build here in the state. But for COVID times, we've also, as you know, received some significant stimulus from the federal government. And in fact, I believe there is currently um, a bill that is moving and likely to achieve another round of relief for um, families, but also I believe for local and state government as well. And so we've been able to supplement um, some of our state revenue and add to that with these federal dollars. So in my first budget cycle as a state representative, typically we would be done in July when we start a new fiscal year, just <laughs> like the city of Melrose starts a fiscal year in July. Uh, but we delayed that and passed month to month budgets for a while where we waited to sort of get a better handle on the economic fallout from COVID and also to see what the federal government was maybe going to be able to complete and send our way. And it was a testament that we actually did it that way because by the time we got around, by the time we did our real budget um, deliberation and work in the fall, we had a much clearer picture. We knew um, that it wasn't actually as bad as we had thought it might be. And we knew exactly how much we could draw from our rainy day fund, essentially. And we built that up over the last decade to a sizable right. amount, which put us mm -hmm. in, in good financial footing. So we were able to draw down from that, but then be able to still, you know, fund some of these really important um, departments and agencies that you reference in terms of DUA uh, with respect to housing security, the um, the rental assistance program, we invested historically in that, for example, we um, increased funding for our parks um, and our public spaces, which I don't know about you, but over the last year, that has been a godsend to be able to take my boys to some of our state parks and let them run around in fresh air or even in snow. Um, <laughs> we are limited in where we can go these right. days. Right. Um, so, so now we're starting a new budget cycle. We just finished fiscal 21, obviously late and understandably so. Um, and as we go into fiscal 22, you know, we're, the governor and his administration and then the House and Senate um, House Ways and Means chairs and leadership are again assessing and trying to determine, determine what we think our likely revenue sources will be and how much we expect to have starting out the new fiscal year in July. The governor produced his budget proposal this month, and now the House will be taking up the budget process um, and working on our own bill um, that I understand, and I haven't done this in, in the normal cadence of the work as a representative, right. that should happen in the April time frame. at which point we hand it over to the Senate for the Senate to work on its bill, and then we'll reconcile those two bills and, and aim to get something to the governor in June to start out a July fiscal year 22. So there's well, a lot there, but, there's, uh, a, there's a lot on your plate. And um, unfortunately, um, you know, I think a year ago, we didn't really think that we were going to be still in this position and right. still talking about how we can find um, the resources to address some of these problems. But um, I'm happy that you're there for, and I'm sure that your constituents are as well, for, um, you know, for your guidance and for your decision making and your thoughtfulness uh, in terms of, you know, prioritizing the needs of the community. Um, sure. I'm, I'm thinking we probably need to wrap this up pretty soon, we could probably go on for at least an hour or more. But um, I know that um, you have an, uh, an interest in coming back. And yeah, um, we're going to probably see you on your own hosting your own show um conversations with kate and i'm hopeful that um some of the things we talked about today you'll be able to bring in uh, a few of the state you know people from the state who can great you, idea. you can kind of kind of do a deep dive um with somebody from dph or unemployment or whatever because i i feel like you know even if we see you know the light at the end of the tunnel uh, with the vaccines coming, these are these are issues that have are going to have long term repercussions: housing, Absolutely. unemployment, um, the public impact health, on our students, just learning. Right. You right. Know, and yeah, so we didn't forth. even talk about education, Kate. I mean, you know, you right. were working for the Department of Education. I was on the school committee. We didn't even get to talk about education. So. Um, right. But I know that's uh, that is um, you know one of your one of your primary focuses as well. So right. um, I think um, it's been great to, to meet the rep today and get a little overview of of um, your work and your challenges. And um, just thank you again for your accessibility to the communities that you represent. And 
I hope that we will see you again on MMTV in the near future. Well, thank you, Mary Beth. It was really nice to spend a little time with you. Um, and I think having this conversation reinforces for me that it's not only, I don't only enjoy reaching out to the community and sharing some information, but I also appreciate hearing from residents, from you, from others. You give me really good ideas and a sense of what people care about, where I can provide more guidance or support, you know, where are, where are issues that people need to have more information about. So just by way of example, in my weekly newsletter, the one I sent out last week on February 2nd was entirely about the COVID-19 vaccination rollout process and its progress to date. Um, just to answer questions that I'd heard from multiple um, multiple community members, how to, how to apply to get a vaccine, what is a comorbidity that would qualify you to be in a certain um, priority schedule, and so forth. Um, and th those ideas come to me not just in my own vacuum of the world, but in fact from continuing to be involved in the community and hear from folks. So I would encourage you know people in Melrose and in the district to check in with me if you have good ideas or questions because it, it helps enhance the work that I do and inform you know the, the resources that I'm trying to make available to folks. And people can sign up for your newsletter on uh, Kate for Rep. That's correct. And they can um, reach out to you through through that website. You could, or yeah. uh, through your through your office in the state house. That's right. Through my state, um, we can put all that up. I'm sure through yeah. the, my office yeah, we'll number or my rep um, email account. That's exactly right. And I'm I'm always really grateful when people do check in and, and give me a sense of what they're thinking about. And I know that you are still uh, working remotely. You're not necessarily going into the state house, yeah. so I'm sure um, you're you're putting in more than your normal uh, forty hour week or whatever it would be. And um, um, you know you're re you're really responsive to people. So I'm going to encourage our viewers to definitely reach out get their names on your newsletter so they'll know what's happening and make a connection so that uh, going forward, if they are facing issues or if they have ideas that they are willing to share, they'll know how to reach you. Thank you, that would be great. I'd love to great. hear from you. All right.